All right, so thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, for, for joining. And uh, especially thank you, uh, Victor, for taking the time to, to come and present uh, your paper. Uh, so yeah, um, so at Philly, we, we have opened our NLP breakfast. So at the beginning, it was an internal presentation reading group. And we wanted to open it. And uh, at first, uh, we want to share uh, some knowledge that we that we get from reading papers or from working on different projects in the field of uh, natural language processing. So today we we are lucky to have Victor San presenting a paper on uh, hierarchical uh, multitask learning. So it's a paper uh, that has been presented at uh, AAAI uh, this year. So thank you, Victor, for for presenting. Yeah, uh, thank you, Peter, for presenting. Um, I guess I'm taking the screen now. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear? Uh, can you see my screen now? Um. Yes, okay. you can see yeah. my screen. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for introducing uh, me, Peter. Thanks for having us. Uh, it's uh, really excited to be sharing here. Um, I'm very really excited to be part of this. Um, so just to uh, just introduce myself, um, so I'm Victor. I'm working at Hugging Face. Um, for those of you who doesn't, have never heard of Hugging Face, uh, we're doing conversational AI. Uh, so basically building AI that can so you can chat with, with teenagers. Uh, and along the way, we, uh, we contribute to the community by open posting uh, our works, either through publishing papers or through uh, public uh, invitation. Uh, so today I'm going to present um, some language understanding work uh, I've been doing and presenting at Victoria and Public here. Uh, it's called hierarchical multitask uh, learning for learning and living complementary tasks. Um, and it's a joint work with Thomas uh, and Sebastian Wood. Um, so I guess you're all familiar with uh, modern NLP, and I'm not saying anything by telling you that modern NLP heavily relies uh, on the world and meaning, uh, so dense implementation of words. And uh, today is like uh, the basis of pretty much all the NLP pipeline. And uh, it's really convenient to use, mostly because it's almost free to obtain uh, in the sense that you do not need to have table data. You just create the internet, have some, uh, have some uh, text, and then you can compute your power and you have your water in uh, the second thing is that uh, you have uh, really nice algebra-like properties. Uh, so this was like one of the first things in the product of paper. Uh, if you take the meanings of a king minus men plus women, you will take queen. So you have this nice algebra-like properties for the world of meaning that you have. Uh, and more re more recently, there has been a lot of work on sentence loop. So, how can we extrapolate uh, the work uh, while the meeting to be able to project sentence uh, in a dense uh, space so to have a fixed length vector representation for sentence? Uh, one of the propositions um, for sentence building was to use multitask learning. So one thing we want with sentence embedding is uh, to have a universal representation in the sense that it could be used across domains and not task specific. So that you could use, and, uh, for example, to understanding or doing question answering. Like something that you could use across tasks and that you do not need uh, to um, heavily hand engineer it uh, for using it. Uh, so one of the answers is to use multitask learning. Why multitask learning? Uh, it, because the idea of multitask learning is that if you can combine different tasks, 
uh, this has can actually bring uh, can actually bring some sort of different knowledge, um, some different aspect of the linguistic features. And uh, these features will complete each other so that you have at the end a richer implication. So one of the propositions was uh, Jensen, so uh, from uh, from researchers at Mila. Uh, they use multitask. Um, there are several ways to do multitask, but the, the way they did it, uh, so you have a shell representation on the bottom of, of uh, the model. And then you have a task specific layers. Uh, that are trained on a supervised way. So in the paper, I think they, they use uh, seven or around 10 different tasks ranging from uh, uh, texture from payment to machine translation. So the idea is that each of these different tasks will bring different kind of knowledge. So you have um, more a richer representation at the end, and, um, and you have um, a more generally label representation that works uh, best in a low risk open environment. So in this work, we actually um, we want to explore uh, multitask learning, uh, the semantic task, uh, and get grasp a uh, better understanding of how multitask work. And for this, we combine four different tasks, uh, which are coreference, relation instruction, entity and detection and name uh, entity recognition. So we combine these four different semantic tasks in a single model. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, um, what I'm going to do is that um, I'm first uh, trying to give, I'm first going to try to give uh, some motivation for this work and why we choose these four specific tasks. Uh, and then I'm going to present the model and really quickly at the end I will um, have an overview uh, of the result and the analysis. Um, so just let me introduce the four different tasks so we, we are all on the same page. Um, so the first task is uh, name meditative recognition. I will say NER for the rest of the talk. Um, so the name entity is a real, real world object or person. Uh, that can be identified, denoted with a proper name. So if I take uh, this sentence I, as an example, Thomas Simpson lives in Springfield with his wife and three kids. Uh, there are two, uh, there are two entities, uh, named entities, which are Thomas Simpson, refers to a person, and Springfield, a location. So NER is the task of identifying and classifying the name entities in a sentence. Uh, the second task is mention detection. Uh, it's slightly more general uh, than name entity recognition, uh, in the sense that it's not limited to name entity. So if I take uh, this sentence, the man held in the sinking vessel and the ship was able to be sent in coffee cup. We have four uh, mentions here, the man, uh, which is a, a person, the sinking vessel and the ship, they refer to vehicles and Corsica, which is the location. And for those of you who are wondering, Corsica is a small island in Italy. Uh, Coreference uh, is the idea that uh, you can have different mentions referring to the same thing uh, in the real world. So if I take these two sentences, my mom tasted the cake, she liked it. Uh, my mom and she refer to the same person and the case and it refer to the same thing in the real world. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth task, uh, relation extraction, uh, uh, aims at extracting relation, semant the semantic relation between the mention. So if I take this sentence, Homer Simpson is the head of the power plant, uh, then we have this relation that Homer Simpson works for um, the power plant. So this is relation extraction. Um, now I'm go going to give three little examples just to motivate and show you how uh, these tasks are related and connected and can actually benefit from each other. Um, so if you take uh, the sentence X works for Y and you know that you have the relation uh, so X works for Y, then X 
is more likely to be a person and why it's more likely to be either an organization or a person. Uh, second example, I love Melbourne. I've lived there three years. I live, uh, I live three years in the city. So if you know that Melbourne and the city are current and you know the relation I live in the city, then Melbourne is more likely to be location. And the third example, um, Bell announced a 500, a five, a five, $500 million net loss. The company is near bankruptcy. Uh, if you know that Dell and the company are co-occurring, then Dell is more likely to be an organization and not the person, say, someone called Michael Dell. So uh, co-occurring can actually help uh, NER and uh, So here are like three little examples just to motivate why we choose this forecast. Uh, now I'm going to introduce the model we use. So it's a hierarchical model um, uh, in the sense that we introduced uh, some hierarchies between, um, between the different tasks. Um, we also introduced a new sampling strategy. I'm going to go through that. Uh, one of the questions when you're doing multitask is how do you actually do the multitask? So, so uh, in a simple machine learning setting, you uh, generally have one that is fit, one loss that one to optimize. Here we have different tasks, with different data sets, and different losses to optimize. So how do we do that? Um, I'm going to go through also the results. So we have state of the art results on three different tasks, at least uh, when we publish the paper. Um, and we are going also to analyze the experience of multitasking. So about the model. Um, so it's a hierarchical model in the sense that we want to have a low level task at the bottom of the, the model uh, and higher level tasks that need much more pre-processing or more complex processing at the top of the model. Uh, there are actually several, um, a lot of work actually don't consider this linguistic hierarchy between the tasks, uh, but the idea is that you want to start with simple tasks and uh, and let the, the more complex tasks be, um, treat the more complex task later. So what we have is we have a name attribute of NER at the bottom of the model, then we treat uh, detection. And on uh, the top layers, we have coreference and relation expression. Uh, so just not here that we do not introduce um, any hierarchy in order between coreference and relation expression, and mostly because we don't have a strong argument to argue that one of these tasks is um, harder than the other. Um, at the bottom of the model, we use um, a shared representation, uh, which is a concatenation of different problem meanings. Uh, so first we use a really classic flow uh, with pre channel meaning. Uh, then we use ELMO, which was uh, the state of the art when we wrote the paper. So ELMO are contextualized on the meaning, different than Globe in the sense that um, uh, your embedding for a token uh, will be different if you take the same token in another sentence. And we also have a uh, character level uh, world meaning. So character level world meaning are uh, basically world meaning that are fit on the character level. So using the sequence of characters and not the token itself. And it's, uh, we will see that it will be uh, really relevant for doing it. Uh, things like in the R uh, We also introduced short cross connection. Uh, so it's basically the blue uh, arrows that are represented here. Uh, so why do we uh, use short cross connection? So that every layers, every layers of the model can actually benefit from the base uh, shell. So if you take like here, if you are here. Uh, so the mention detection layer, 
uh, it actually takes uh, two different uh, representations, which are uh, the previous representation in the NER layer and the base, just the shared base. Um, not necessarily the most exciting part. Uh, so for NER, we use a condi conditional random field, uh, which uh, is a classical uh, model for doing sequence tagging uh, tasks. Same for mention detection. Uh, for relation extraction, we use a really simple linear scorer. Um, and um, for coherence, we use a linear scorer plus a pair scorer. So it's, uh, it's described in uh, the paper of the and how uh, to have um, So one of the main questions when doing multitask learning is how do you train? You have, here we have four different tasks, so four different losses. Um, so what we do, we introduce a really simple training procedure that we call uh, um, proportional complaint. Uh, it basically tells you that at each time you're going to uh, sample a new task um, and optimize towards this task. So now, uh, following which distribution are we going to sample? Um, so it's really simple in the sense that if we consider two different tasks, so task one with 10 batches and task two with 30 batches, I will say that I'm going to sample task one um, 0 0.25 time and task two I'm gonna sample task two um zero point seven five uh, time. So it's proportional to the size of the data. Uh, so when I have chosen the task I want to optimize really classic um, I'm gonna sample a batch um, of all these data sets and then optimize for it. Um, now I'm going to give a really quick quick overview of the results. I don't want to really get into all the details uh, here in the paper. Um, so first we analyze the, the, the impact of using multi-task learning versus a single task learning. Uh, and we all realize um, a few things, maybe just three things. Uh, so we had at this time uh, state of the art results on um, mention detection and relation and also uh, name it to the function, not here in the field, but uh, we have a really strong baseline this time. Um, something interesting to note is that the multitask settings always, almost always outperform the single task setting, which uh, really emphasizes the fact that uh, some other tasks can benefit uh, the other task and help them to gain some performance. Uh, the strongest gap is actually observed in relation to action. Um, just to dive into the figures, um, so here, um, I'm not going to go into details, but basically uh, here we show that all the, the motivation that is in, uh, in the beginning are confirmed by the figures here. So coherence can help NER relation when you have relation and coherence can help NER. And relation can help both NER and mention. So something not really intuitive here is to note is that the higher uh, the higher level task can actually benefit the lower level task. Not really intuitive in the sense that you could guess that the low level task can help the higher level task. But here we show that the information flowing on the higher level task and actually also help the, the task at the bottom of the table. Um, someone can argue that the hierarchy order is a bit, um, is a bit arbitrary. Uh, why did I choose, um, why did I choose this order? Why did I, why didn't I put uh, mention fiction at the bottom or coherence at the bottom? I don't know. Um, so what we do is actually shuffle the order of the task. Uh, so we shuffle mention and detection and NER. So just recall that mention and detection is slightly more general than NER, so slightly more complex. And what we observe is a, con is a drop of performance across all tasks. So on um, NER mention, relation is quite uh, so it actually suggests that uh, the order of the hierarchy should follow 
uh, the difficulties, the complexity of the task. So we justify, kind of justify why we choose to order this new task. Um, also, one could argue why do you use so much embedding? Um, so, just to recall, we use three different types of embeddings um, globy, contextual embeddings, so elbow, and character level embeddings. Um, so, here we're trying to analyze uh, what drives the performance in the embedding, the elbow, the character embedding. Uh, so, we basically remove uh, one by one the embeddings and show that uh, Elmo is driving most of the performance. Um, around, we have a drop uh, of around four points across all tasks that we move Elmo. Uh, and there is a strong impact of character level embeddings both on NER, relation, and correspondence. Um, so it, it also emphasizes uh, the influence of short code connection. Uh, just to recall that shortcut connections um, it enable uh, the shared presentation at the bottom to be shared across all layers. So if you impact um, the base of presentation, if you actually also impact um, the top uh, the top layers in the bottom. Um, one of uh, the analysis I'm most excited about um, is what did the embedding is learn. Uh, so there are a lot of works uh, right now uh, which are trying to figure out what uh, the model is learning, what kind of representation, what kind of information the model is able to extract from the training. Um, and here we focus um, so on the sentence meaning we learn through the model. And for that we use a work, um, a work called Saint Eval, uh, from Alexi Kono in 2018. Uh, so they introduced um, 10 different problem tasks to, um, to try to evaluate what kind of linguistic features a model uh, is learning through the embedding. So is it uh, syntax information, is it more semantic information, is it just surface information? Uh, so we use different, uh, 10 different problem tasks and the main hypothesis behind it is that if you uh, perform really well on uh, on this really simple problem task, uh, then your model has actually learned some relevant features uh, for this particular linguistic feature, uh, linguistic aspect that you want to model. Um, so we actually analyze analyze all the all the layers that we have in our model, so the four different encoders. So the one for NER mentioned character and simulation, but also the shared distinction and debate of the form. Um, I just want to point out that um, up to now I only talked about one embedding. So uh, for each token you have an embedding. So how can you go from uh, from, uh, from token embedding to sentence embedding? Uh, we do just simply do, do some pooling. Um, so for the encoders, we use max pooling, and for the shared presentation, we use uh, average pooling. So just uh, following like the, the baseline. Um, so here are the results. There are a lot of figures here. I just want to point out three different things. Um, the first thing is that the shared, uh, the base shared representation is already uh, extremely rich. Uh, in the sense that across all tasks, you have really strong figures already. Uh, so for the sentence length, you have already 72% of accuracy, uh, the word content 70, etc. So for surface information, syntax information, semantic information, the uh, shared reputation is already extremely rich. Um, the second point um, is that you have a really strong um, discrepancies between the results, um, between the world emitting, so the base representation, and the encoder representation. So what we see here is that um, you have kind of strong results for syntax information and surface information for, um, uh, for the base representation, uh, but you have a really strong drop, especially on the world content, on all the encoders. 
So you have 70%, and all, through all the encoders, you have less than 11% of accuracy for when you are in head of surface information. We suggest that, and you don't have this much effect on semantic information for the encoders. So it suggests that the encoders kind of uh, focus more, are trying to focus more on some semantic information uh, and kind of dropping all this syntactic interface information. Um, which makes sense in this. Uh, which makes sense when you know that all the different tasks, all the four different tasks we are using, are actually semantic, uh, semantic tasks. And the last point is that um, across all encoders, uh, the coherence encoder actually have the best performance, so the green box, uh, across all different tasks. Uh, we suggest in a way that uh, the coherence is the most difficult task. Um, between all uh, our uh, all different tasks. Uh, we also analyze the training speed. Um, so catchphrase multitasking accelerates the training. Uh, so basically it means that it converges faster when you use multitask learning rather than if you do using single task learning. Um, and so just to conclude, so we introduced a hierarchical um, task learning model um, for four different tasks. Uh, we had um, state-of-the-art results uh, on three different tasks. We also introduced a simple uh, sampling strategy that we called uh, proportional sampling. And we analyzed uh, several different aspects of most task learning, um, both on the training side and on the ML. So I guess I can take some reactions or questions now. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> presentation. Uh, hey, Victor. So I have a question about the optimizer. How do you yeah. deal with optimizer when you have several tasks? Do you have one optimizer that optimizes for different losses? Uh, so, yeah, okay, I understand the question. So, um, so what, I, what we did in this works, uh, we use uh, one optimizer for each task, um, especially because um, um, you won't sample each task as frequently. So maybe one task will be sampled a lot of times, another, another task will be just sampled. Uh, really few times because it's simpler. Uh, and since we're actually updating the learning rates um, through the steps, so you have a higher learning rate at the beginning of the training and a smaller uh, learning rate at the, at the end of the training, we use four different optimizers uh, for each task. So each task has its own optimizer. Okay. But you could actually use one single optimizer. Um, it's it's a design choice. Uh, okay. If you have a question online, and you can also use the chat room to ask oh, yeah, questions. We, we can, like, can, uh, uh, if you cannot speak. I have a question. So in the paper, um, there was a sentence saying the updates for a particular task affect the layers associated with this task and all the layers below, but not the layers above. Mm -hmm. So does this mean that, um, for example, the NER task, the only weights that would be updated for NER are the CRF? Uh, yeah. It literally means that, uh, so, can you my screen now? Or? Yep. Yes. Uh, if you, yeah, let's say you are here, so you choose like a relation, uh, so you choose relation extraction, uh, so the gradient will flow through all the arrows, so I'm going through the encoder, this arrow, this encoding symbol, and the shell application. But it won't act, uh, it won't actually affect, uh, it won't update these weights or these weights. 
Okay, so then for NER, would it affect like the CRF and the encoder at the top and the word representations? It won't update. So if you do the update, um, the final update after the gradient, uh, the gradient. Uh, for NER, you we just affect this part. Okay. The parameters won't be updated here, but you can actually affect the performance. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I have a the other Victor here. I have a question quickly. Um, can you tell me? I mean, I'm just curious uh, how much the you show different types of architecture. Could you comment on basically what? Could you just tell me more about the difference between this approach versus the Schrobermanian approach, where the tasks are just at the end of a large, basically, you know, series of encoders, and then at the end we we'll just have like the task assembled uh, at the basically top layers. That's something I'm just curious about. And if you have tried, and maybe I didn't see the comparisons, but I'm just curious about this. Um, and the second question I had was whether you had the results without the shortcuts uh, in place. Um, so I can first answer the second question. It's really simple. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, we didn't have much time like, to do all these experimentations and to close the paper, so I don't have. So if you don't, so, so that how do you know how much of the final results uh, rely on the on the shortcuts versus on the lay, on the basically previous layers? Um, I don't have like um, objective figures to uh, to base my intuitions here, but my intuition is that um, the shortcut connection would help a lot uh, since we saw that uh, removing embeddings actually not. So maybe if you like here, uh, uh, removing embeddings actually, so removing embeddings at the shell representation, so the base of the model actually affects all the layers. So my intuition here is that um, this shared representation is really important. Mm. The information flowing through the encoders uh, is kind of different than what the shared representation brings. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you actually repeat your first question? So, you know, you showed your slide, the first slide you had, I think is the very first one, or maybe the second one, was the first architecture, the one from, I mean, Subramanian, I think, 2018. Like the one with, you know, basically a flat, like just basically flowing from shared. Ah. Uh, yeah. You see what I mean? Like the, um, this one. Yeah. yeah. So, just basically telling, I would just be curious to just hear more about, maybe I missed that, but. Difference between this approach and your approach in terms of um, the basically the performances and why you chose to not go this route. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is uh, one of the ways. This is one of the ways to promote task learning uh, is that you have a shell representation and all the tasks actually do the same representation. Uh, what we want, what I wanted here is that we introduce some hierarchy in the sense that uh, we want more complex information at the top of the model. You don't have such uh, an order between the, the task here. And uh, one of um, one of the intuition here is that uh, if you go uh, if you go further in the model, Coherence actually don't rely on the same linguistic features than NER. So you you don't want really to have like the same representation. You don't want coherence to be based on the same uh, representation than NER, for example. It actually makes sense that uh, try trying to disentangle um, this representation so that um, each task has its own specific representation. So maybe I missed it, but do you have then the do you have have you compared these two type of architectures on your tests on your four tests? No, I didn't compare like in the shared translation uh, way. Okay, thank you. I I, I have a question. Um, uh, for the ar architecture that you used for the encoder, the uh, multi-layer DLSTM. Uh, have, have you thought have you thought about uh, using um, additional layers or some um, kind of arch architecture that use uh, um, attention like the transformers or something like that 
or do you think that they would be useless for the, this kind of tests? Um, I think we can really simply uh, replace ENSTM by transformer. Um, uh, I, uh, I mean, it's like a few lines of code and you just you run the experiments. Uh, that's something that we actually could do um, in a really simple way and I do believe that you could gain some points just replacing LSTM's my transformer. Um, all the recent results uh, actually suggest that uh, replacing for like sequence modeling transformer uh, perform better than LSTM. Uh, so yeah, we could actually do that. Uh, it's not. It wasn't really like the point of the paper. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like the goal of the paper was not like to do like, state of the art. It was like just trying to analyze what multitask can bring. So that's why like we did it in simply in the sense that we use LSTM. Okay, thank you. The same way we, you could actually replace Elmo with a uh, bird of uh, OpenAGPT, some other contextualized embeddings. Um, it could also like bring some points as well. Okay, thank you. Hi, so we have a, a question on the, uh, on the chat. So, a question for Ashari. In your world representation, why not use only Glove or Elmo? And have you tried recently world representation with BERT? So I think it's... Okay, like, like the second part of the question, I yeah. just answered that. Uh, so we, yeah, we could definitely use BERT. Um, we actually, like in the ablation study with the embedding, we just built Glove at the end. Um, and so we had a drop of performance across all tasks. Uh, so, like, I think like the fundamental uh, the fundamental um, difference uh, with Glove and Elmo between Glove and Elmo is like the contextualization. And for um, I think uh, it seems to me that for semantic tags, the context contextualization uh, is uh, really important. Uh, so just for NER, uh, so Dell doesn't mean the same thing if you're talking about the organization or if you're talking about the person. So contextualization brings a lot. So that's one of the reasons uh, to use contextualism. So one other question you have, you could have is, uh, Elmo is already based on character level embeddings. Why do you actually add other character level embeddings? Um, I don't really have a strong argument here, and uh, just saying that it performs better. Uh, but I also do think that um, the, since we are learning the character embeddings uh, uh, from scratch, uh, they bring us um, some different uh, linguistic features than Elmo, because Elmo is trained in the language model way. Uh, so you will try uh, to predict the next word or the previous word because it's uh, bidirectional for Elmo. But since you're uh, concentrating on, you're focusing on uh, a language modeling task, it's kind of different than the training signal you have here. Here we have a training signal that is all uh, just based on semantic task, and there is no language modeling here. So I believe that the information contained in the character level embeddings and the character level embeddings in Elmo are kind of different. Uh, I had a question about the uh, the choice of the hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, so at the beginning, you showed some intuitions. So. Does your choice um, is is it about your first intuitions or did you base your work on some linguistics work? Or? Um. So there there have been work uh, combining trying to combine um, mention detection relation. So this is really classic in the sense that. Uh, uh, you consider relation correct if you get the two arguments. So, and obviously the two arguments are usually mentioned. 
So it makes sense to combine mention and relation. Uh, since NER and mention are related, uh, I haven't seen much combining the two, mention and NER, because uh, I, yeah, I think, I believe they are slightly um, similar. Uh, but using coherence uh, for doing uh, this kind of semantics task, uh, I didn't see much work. Uh, I think you have like some works trying to incorporate coherence uh, in language modeling. Uh, all the works trying to incorporate entity uh, modeling into language modeling, but using coherence uh, in such a way, uh, there isn't much work to do that. Thank you. So thank you, Victor, for your time, uh, your great presentation. And thank you for answering uh, some questions. Uh, OK, so we, uh, we will keep uh, doing um, this NLP breakfast every two or three weeks. So yeah, if anyone wants to present either a paper or a work on NLP while working on, uh, feel free to we just uh, no, we'll set up uh, for next uh, next time. And then if you are living close by Redwood City, feel free to join us and have some good croissant. Here. Yeah, I'm kind of jealous. You have so much croissant. Like. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to send you some. To yeah, some. Definitely. To thank you for your presentation. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Victor. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. See you Thank next you. time, guys. <laughs>